please turn with me to 1 Corinthians, excuse me, 1 Chronicles, chapter 16. 1 Chronicles, chapter 16, the Bible says in verse 8, Give praise to the Lord. Now, I don't know what you came here to do. But I came here to praise the Lord. Can I get a hallelujah to that? Give praise to the Lord. Proclaim his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Sing to him. Sing praise to him. Tell of all his wonderful acts. Glory in his name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Look to the Lord and his strength. Seek his face always, and the church said. Amen. The title of my lesson this morning is simply, Look Up. Look Up. Before we get into it here this morning, I want to just say a few thank yous. I want to express some gratitude. And first, I want to say thank you so much to Roger and Kama Parlor. So Goldana and I moved into our apartment on Friday, uh, Friday just a couple days ago. Uh, but we've been here for the, almost the past two weeks, and uh, Roger and Kama were gracious enough to host us in their home. They let us stay in their guest room. They uh, let us drink their coffee and eat their food. They listened to our son cry, and then they didn't complain one time. <laughs> thank you guys so much. I want to say uh, thank you to uh, Stephen and Jenny Rydstead, uh, wherever they are. Uh, Stephen and Jenny, they hosted us in their home last weekend, and uh, Stephen pulled out the uh, Blackstone griddle, and he cooked uh, about the best bacon cheeseburger I've ever had in my entire life. The Rydsteads were super hospitable. Uh, if I'm going to give any challenge this morning, I want to challenge all of you to set up some time to go to either Roger and Camus house to eat some ribs and potatoes or go to uh, Stephen and Jenny's house and let uh, Stephen throw down on the Blackstone for you. I'm sorry, guys. There goes your schedule and your budget. <laughs> I also want to say thank you to Craig and Keisha Davidson. At the, at the drop of a hat, they were more than willing to pick up my wife and my son from the airport because uh, the three of us were planning to drive across country with all of our stuff, and we have a, a, not even a two-year-old yet. We didn't realize that that would be very hard for him. <laughs> so last minute, we flew out Goldana and Ronnie and the Davidsons just immediately dropped everything and picked them up from the airport and drove them all the way to Marysville. Thank you guys so much. We love you. I want to thank uh, Joel and Courtney Parlor. Thank you guys for uh, welcoming us warmly to the Seattle church. For opening up your arms. Thank you for entrusting us with the city region. Uh, we want to do our very best. And uh, Joel, thanks for letting me preach this morning, bro. And uh, I want to say a thank you to everybody that planned our greeting party a week ago. We felt super loved and encouraged. And uh, I just want to say I'm very grateful for each and every one of you. I felt loved and welcomed from the moment we got here. And uh, I could just feel the love and family in the room. I, uh, I promised myself I wasn't going to cry. But uh, when we were taking communion, I, I, I let a little tear loose, but I sucked it back in. I, I sucked it back in so that Joel wouldn't see it. You know, you got to be a man, right? No, Jesus was very manly, and he wept. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for everything. I want to begin my lesson this morning with a spoken word. Um, now, disclaimer, I didn't write it myself. I'm not talented like that. But this is a spoken word I had heard for the first time when I was 
in college at Cal State Fullerton, and I was taking a communications class. And uh, that was my major, and uh, the very first day of class, one of my professors played this spoken word. And it goes like this. I have 422 friends, yet I am lonely. I speak to all of them every day, yet none of them really know me. The problem I have sits in the spaces between looking into their eyes or at a name on a screen. I took a step back and opened my eyes. I looked around and then realized that this media we call social is anything but. When we open our computers and it's our doors we shut. All this technology we have, it's just an illusion of community, companionship, a sense of inclusion. Yet when you step away from this device of delusion, you awaken to see a world of confusion. We are at our most happy with an experience we share, but is it the same if no one is there? Be there for your friends and they'll be there too, but no one will be if a group message will do. We edit and exaggerate, we crave adulation, we pretend we don't notice the social isolation. We put our words into order until our lives are glistening. We don't even know if anyone is listening. Being alone isn't the problem. Let me just emphasize that if you read a book, paint a picture, or do some exercise, you are being productive and present, not reserved or recluse. You're being awake and attentive and putting your time to good use. So when you're in public and you start to feel alone, put your hands behind your head, step away from your phone, you don't need to stare at your menu or at your contact list. Just talk to one another and learn to coexist. I can't stand to hear the silence of a busy commuter train when no one wants to talk through the fear of looking insane. We're becoming unsocial and no longer satisfies to engage with one another and look into their eyes. We're surrounded by children who, since they were born, watch us living like robots and think it's the norm. It's not very likely you will make world's greatest dad if you can't entertain a child without an iPad. When I was a child, I would never be home. I'd be out with my friends on our bikes we would roam. We'd wear holes in our trainers. This guy was British. He means pants. <laughs> We'd wear holes in our trainers and graze up our knees. We'd build our own clubhouse high in the trees. Now the parks are so quiet, it gives me a chill to see no children outside and the swings hanging still. There's no skipping or hopscotch, no church and no steeple. We're a generation of idiots, smartphones, and dumb people. So look up for your, from your phone, shut down that display, take in your surroundings, and make the most of today. Just one real connection is all it can take to show you the difference that being there can make. So look up from your phone, shut down those displays. We have a finite existence, a set number of days. Why waste all our time getting caught in the net as when the end comes, nothing's worse than regret? I am guilty, too, of being part of this machine, this digital world where we are heard but not seen, where we type and don't talk, where we read as we chat, where we spend hours together without making eye contact. Don't give in to a life where you follow the hype. Give people your love. Don't give them your like. Disconnect from the need to be heard and defined. Go out into the world. Leave distractions behind. Thank you guys very much. Look up. Now, I believe that this is a great spoken word addressing some major issues in our society today. As you can go around and, and see people, human beings, just walking around like this. attention, not connecting with people on a personal basis, and we can get so sucked into this world that we're in now. 
an even greater issue that I see is that people are not only looking up to connect with other people, but people also are not looking up to connect with God. Psalm 34 and verse 5, it says that those who look to him are radiant. Those who look to him are radiant. Now, I know my sisters love that scripture for women's midweek and women's days. (laughs) Radiant. But if you read that scripture, it don't talk about gender. My brothers can be pretty radiant too, amen? It just says those who look to him are radiant. Do I got any radiant brothers here this morning? Now we know we got the radiant sisters too. We have a generation of people that are not looking to God. We have a city full of people that are not looking to God. My wife and I are super grateful to now be here in this great city of Seattle and in the church here. And in the past uh, almost two weeks now, we've had the full Seattle experience, I believe. We're maybe one broken window away from the full Seattle experience. Um, We, we get here, and it's, you know, it's, we're in the, the season of summer, and I, I hear that it, there's all this rain, there's all this fog, and I'm like, surely that's a, you know, that's a winter and spring problem. I was wrong. <laughs> As it was rainy and stormy all, all weekend, we uh, driving around. People are some crazy drivers. I'm happy to be back on the West Coast. I thought in Chicago people drove crazy, but they drive pretty crazy out here. I've already been uh, yelled at and cursed at, and (laughs) I've already been flipped off on the road. (laughs) And then yesterday, as I was driving on the I-5 to go get the rest of my stuff from Roger and Kama's house, I got rear-ended. I uh, I called Joel afterwards, and I told him, bro, I got rear-ended. And he just chuckled, and he's like, man, all these car issues. <laughs> and, and I just said, bro, we were so worried about getting our window smashed into that we didn't even, I didn't even stop to think we'd get into an accident. <laughs> and he's like, yeah, I guess you forgot to pray for that one. And I said, I guess I did. <laughs> so nevertheless, we, uh, we feel very loved by all of you and by the city of Seattle. <laughs> But what I see through uh, so much of this, though, is uh, the disconnect between man and God. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew 14, and we're going to pick up in verse 22. Now, this passage we're about to read takes place right after Jesus feeds the 5,000. And it wasn't only Jesus. Jesus recruited his apostles to help wait on the tables, if you would, serve 5,000 people. Now, I don't know if I have anyone here that's ever served in food service before as maybe like a waiter or a waitress or a host or a busboy or something like that. Right? That's that's, That's some hard work. Am I right? And you're on your feet a lot. Now the context of this passage right here is that Jesus and the apostles, they spent all day going from town to town preaching the word. And Jesus is like, look guys, let's go to the side. Let's go over to this lake here. We're going to get some rest. We're going to get some food. We're going to kick our feet up. We're going to have a great time of just intimate fellowship together. They get there and there's thousands of men and women just waiting to hear the word of God. And, And Jesus is like, we'll feed them something. Like, Jesus, with what? They, they scrounge up a, a few loaves of bread and a couple of fish, and they're like, is this going to get the job done? Jesus says, bet. He grabs it, <laughs> and he transforms it, and he makes it enough for the entire crowd to eat, enough that they had leftovers. There was 5,000 men, and they had leftovers? 
Are you kidding me? They finish serving thousands of people, and then it's like, okay, surely I can get some of these leftovers now. Imagine Peter and John are like, bro, I'm so tired. Jesus has got me running ragged. I just want a piece of that fish. I haven't even gotten it yet. They're like, surely we can rest now, and then this happens. Matthew 14, verse 22, immediately, Jesus wasted no time. Immediately, Jesus made. He didn't ask. He didn't beg them. He said, could you guys please? He said, it says, immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. He was there alone. So they have this huge crowd. Jesus grabs the disciples and says that he made them, so most likely they didn't want to go. Again, they were tired. He made them get into the boat, and then he says to the crowd, all right, you guys are dismissed. Enjoy the fellowship. You, you, don't, have, you don't have to go home, but you don't have to stay here. But you can't stay here. Go ahead. He dismisses them, and then he says, all right, guys, I'm going to go up on the mountainside because I'm going to do an all-night prayer. I'm tired. I need to fill myself back up with the Spirit. <laughs> Let's keep on reading. Verse 24. And the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. Shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. This is the passage of Jesus walking on water. The disciples exhausted a long night. They're rowing this boat in a lake, and all of a sudden, the wind and the waves start whipping up. They're getting buffeted by the water. They're exhausted. They're, they're straining at the oars, it says in the parable, the parallel account in the book of Mark. They're straining at the oars. And then Jesus comes, and he's walking on water. Verse 26. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost! They said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. My first point is look up and don't be afraid. Look up. And don't be afraid. They were fearful when they saw Jesus come. Why? Because they have never seen anything like that before. You know, for us, when a disciple reaches out to us, it is a miracle. And the temptation for us might to be to cry out. I remember when a disciple first came into my life. And I was uh, just a 21-year-old co year old college student living a life of sin and a friend of mine who lived that life with me turned around and did a 180. And he dropped all of his sin and he began seeking God with all of his heart. And you could see it. He, his face was radiant. And he was happy. And he came to me, do you want to read the Bible? Do you want to come to church? And I was excited but also very fearful. Are you guys with me here? It takes some courage to be a follower of Jesus. Maybe it took some courage for you to just get here this morning. And like the disciples, I believe so many of us can battle with fear as well. Jesus said, do not be afraid. Why? Because he knew they were fearful. We as people battle with fear. We fear change. We fear progress. We fear being uncomfortable. We're afraid of God and not in the good way. We fear discipleship, accountability, and discipline. This is the same reason we don't like going to the dentist or the doctor. Man, I hate going to the dentist. I absolutely do not like it. 
Why? Because you're sitting there waiting in that waiting room, and all you can hear in the, in the distance is, <laughs> and you just know, man, I'm about to get it next. And for me, at least, every time I go, they, they, they do the little checkup, and they inspect my mouth, and they, they, they step outside for a second, and you can hear them, like, muttering in the hall. And then they come back, and they're like, so, how often do you floss? And then you get told that you got, like, 15 cavities, that you need braces, that you need a root canal. And you know what, you just, you just got to up, updo the whole thing. I don't know about you guys, but the, the pain, the physical and emotional, can be a lot sometimes. Why? It's uncomfortable to hear the things that we need to change, am I right? And it's the same thing with Christianity. I think so many people know that Jesus is the way the truth, and the life, but they're too afraid that if they come to Jesus, that they know some things need to be changed. They know that they got a couple root canals. They know that they need a good little deep cleaning in there, and they might need to get some braces to straighten some things out. We sometimes can be afraid of the very thing that will save our soul. Jesus was calling Peter by name, but today he is calling you by name as well. Look in Isaiah chapter 43. Keep your thumb there. Or if you got your Bible on your phone, just push the button and go back, I guess. Or your iPad. And if you don't got one of these, I definitely recommend 10 out of 10. (laughs) Isaiah 43 in verse 1. And it says, but now this is what the Lord says. He who created you, Jacob, he who formed you, Israel, do not fear. I have redeemed you. I have summoned you by name. You are mine. Do you know that you belong to God? You are his son. You are his daughter. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, I give Egypt for your ransom, Cush and Seba in your steed, since you are precious and honored in my sight, and because I love you, I will give people in exchange for you, nations in exchange for your life. You know, God loves you as a father loves their child. And you know what? He's the, the greatest parent because So many of us have experienced flawed people in our lives, even possibly our own parents. But the love that a a parent has for a child is the love that God has for us, an unsacrificial, a graceful, and a giving love that truly cannot be measured. God knows every thought, every deed, every word that you have ever said, committed, or done before. And yet he still loves you. And guess what? He knows you. He knows you better than anybody else. He even knows you better than you know yourself. He has created you. And yet he is still calling you by name. Just as Jesus called the disciples to not be afraid and to come, he is calling you out of your boats as well. Are you guys with me here? Be courageous. Answer the call of God. Let's go back to Matthew 14. Matthew 14. We're going to pick it up where we left off. Verse 28. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, 
You ever think those thoughts right there? God, if this is your calling, give me this sign. Lord, if it is you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Perhaps Peter is thinking that there's no way this is Jesus. Let me think of something very impossible to happen to prove that this isn't Jesus and that this is just a, merely a figment of my imagination or a ghost. Tell me to come out on the water and walk on the water just like you. Come. Dang it. I was afraid you were going to say that. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. Are you guys picturing this scene in your mind right now? In the midst of a crazy storm, in the midst of everything that's happening, Jesus comes walking on water, and he just says, come. And Peter makes the leap of faith, steps out of the boat, He did the impossible. But let's keep on reading. Verse 30. But when he saw the wind, I don't know how you see wind, but he saw it apparently. <laughs> he saw the wind. Peter's got a, fifth, a sixth sense or something right there. When he saw the wind, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You have little faith. He just disciples him right on the spot. You have little faith. You know, I, I'll, I'll never forget. I remember uh, Joel preached a sermon uh, for one of our conferences that we had. And he said in the Bible that there's only three types of faith. Great faith, little faith, or no faith. And I remember he asked the question, what's your faith at right now? Do you got great faith? Do you have little faith? Or do you have no faith? And he said, why did you doubt? You see, doubt puts you out. And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. I guess multiplying the bread and the fish wasn't enough. They needed to see this right here. <laughs> when they had crossed over, they landed at Genesaret. And when the men of that place recognized Jesus, they sent word to all the surrounding country. People brought all their sick to him, begged him to let the sick just touch the edge of his cloak. And all who touched it were healed. And the church said... You know, you can have fear, but you cannot let fear have you. My second and last point is look up and have great faith. Look up and have great faith. You know, Peter gave in to his fear when he began to look around at the situation. He saw his surroundings and he began to sink. But when he was focused on Jesus, when he had his eyes on the prize, he was walking on water. The same goes for us. There will be storms in your life. There will be persecutions. That's a promise of the Bible. But somewhere, I don't know where we signed this when we were born, but just as people, we signed up for a life of hardship at times. There will be storms. That's not a, that's not a question. But the question is, is how we, will we respond to the storms? Will we look to Jesus? Or will we get our faith by our surroundings and sink? 
You know, at times the world has let us down. And if we allow it, it will let us down. And because of that, we can become hope deferred. We could lose our faith and end up walking away from God altogether. And that is what it looks like when we put our hope in things that are not God. When we look to things that are not God. When you look to God and you put your hope and your faith in him, he will never let you down. Are you with me here? Faith is to believe what you do not see. The reward of this faith is to see what you believe. Faith is the bird that feels the light when the dawn is still dark. And faith is not believe without proof, but, but trust without reason. You know, faith and fear are practically opposites, but you can have both faith and fear at the same time. It really just matters which one you act upon. You know, I was thinking through some of the fears that I have. Now, I don't know that I would necessarily say that I'm afraid of heights or roller coasters, but I can certainly say I'm not a huge fan. Or let me be honest, maybe I'm afraid of heights. <laughs> let me just be real here. In Ohio, we have uh, this theme park called Cedar Point, and it's got some of the largest roller coasters in the world. So naturally, we decided to go there with some of the, some of the disciples. <laughs> they have one roller coaster called, uh, I believe it's Drag Strip. And it's like, a, like it's like a drag strip car. It's at a complete stop, and then it takes off at about 120 miles an hour, just straight out the gate, and it goes straight up. 90-degree angle, straight up. It twirls around. And then it comes straight down 90 degree angle, and then it comes to a screeching halt. We get there. We went uh, last year for Cinco de Mayo. We get there and we find out drag strip is closed. I'm like, oh, dang it. <laughs> ah, shucks. That's too bad. The second biggest one, though is a uh, um, Millennium Force. And this thing, this monstrosity of a roller coaster, <laughs> it climbs up super slow. I, I think it's about uh, four or 500 feet, I wanna say. It just climbs up and it feels like you're climbing forever. And you're just climbing and climbing and climbing and you get over the edge and that thing about drops straight down. And I remember just sitting there on the climb, like, I'm about to get it. <laughs> I didn't even have anyone next to me. I was in, there's two seats. I was in the cart by myself. <laughs> I didn't have somebody to hang on to because our son was not even a year old yet, so Goldana stayed off with him. <laughs> She's braver than me. Don't get me wrong. She probably would have gone on that thing. <laughs> or maybe not. But I'm all by myself, and I'm just, man, this thing is going to be terrible. And we go down, and I'm just, ah! <laughs> and it was wild. And as I'm there in line, seemingly forever, waiting to get on this roller coaster, anxiety is running high. You guys ever been there before? I think walking with God is kind of like riding on a roller coaster. I think riding, uh, walking with God is kind of riding with God. <laughs> they see me rolling. <laughs> I think walking with God is kind of like riding on a roller coaster. Why? Because with God, there's ups. Sometimes there's downs. Sometimes there's twists. 
Sometimes there's turns. Sometimes you go on the loop-de-loop -loop where you just go upside down for a second and come back. <laughs> Sometimes it's, you're afraid and it's anxiety-inducing, and other times it's the, the time of your life. But, you know, there's a few different people on a roller coaster. There's the person, like me, on a roller coaster, where you're sitting there in line, you're anxious, you get on the roller coaster, and you're so tense, and you're holding on to the handles, and you would never, ever think about lifting your hands up, and you're just kind of like white-knuckling and gritting your teeth through it all. There's also the people that wait in the line, they're also super anxious, but right when they get up to the roller coaster, they back off. They get out of line. They wait all that time, they put in that effort, spent that money, and they don't even get on the ride. Because the fear put them out. But then there's that person. I bet this is Harry right here. Where you're, that person that's on the roller coaster, they got the hands up, <laughs> they're laughing, they're screaming, they're having the time of their life, and then you know the little picture comes by, they're like, <laughs> not a care in the world. They're even going upside down, they're woo, <laughs> and they're having a great old time. I think walking with God can be a little bit like a roller coaster, but how do you, how do, you do the ride? Are you enjoying every step of the ride? Through the ups, through the downs, through the twists, through the turns, can you find a reason to rejoice and smile and let loose and look to the one who created you? In closing, look up. Don't just look up from your cell phone, but look up to God. Choose to give way to faith over fear. Do not miss out the opportunities and the plan that God has for your life. And simply sit back and enjoy the ride. Fix your eyes on the Prince of Peace, the pioneer and perfecter of your faith, Jesus Christ. Have great faith and make the Son of God the Lord of your life. Thank you guys very much. I love you, and to God be all the glory.